So in this short video, we're going to do more examples where we use the technique of integration by parts. Now, sometimes when we're using, well, any technique, we may have to combine more than one technique. So for example, uh, you may need to make a change of variables before you can even start your integration by parts. And Here's an example. I'd like to evaluate the integral from 0 to 1 of arc sine of x. We actually saw this integral previously, where we just used, um, we looked at this area, excuse me, this integral as representing an area. And we were able to uh, find an integral in terms of sine of x that uh, gave us the same area. But now we're going to actually use first a u substitution. But since we have our u and v in our formula over here, I'm going to make a change of variables and use y as my new variable. So I'm going to say y equals arc sine of x. So then x equals sine of y, and dx is cosine of y dy. And so I can also change my bounds when x equals 0. y will have to equal 0 as well. And uh, when x equals 1, y is going to be pi over 2, because sine of pi over 2 equals 1. All right, so if I write my integral now in terms of x, my integrand now is x cosine of x. My bounds go from 0 to pi over 2. We actually worked out this integral uh, in our first video. It was our first one of our first examples. And so here are all the details again, but I'm not going to state them explicitly. But we got the same answer for this original integral as we got um, when we uh, looked at it as an area, which was, and the answer was pi over 2 minus 1. Another technique or another combination of techniques is that when we find the antiderivative for dv, uh, we may need, may need to do more work. So far in all of our examples, um, we could just uh, mentally determine the antiderivative. Sometimes you have to do uh, some more work. So let's look at this example. I'd like to evaluate the definite integral from 0 to radical pi of x cubed sine of x squared dx. So one thing that's different is I'm going to split this x cubed as x squared times x. Now, the reason why I did that is because if I try to find the antiderivative of sine of x squared, I'm going to get stuck. However, if I break off one of these x's from the x cubed, I can find the antiderivative of x sine of x squared. I'll need to use a u substitution or y substitution or some other substitution in order to find it. But um, I can find the antiderivative. And so, that's why I'm going to choose u to be x squared, so du is 2x dx. Then dv is x sine of x squared dx. So now, in order to find the antiderivative, I'm going to go ahead and make a change of variables. I'm going to let y equal x squared. So dy is 2x dx and x dx, so my x times dx is half of y. And so then the antiderivative, well, dv now is 1 half sine of y dy. And I know the antiderivative of sine of y is minus cosine of y. So now I have minus 1 half cosine of y for v. And I need to change that back to x. So that would be minus 1 half cosine of x squared. Now, let me put that into my formula. The u 
v would be minus one half x squared cosine of x squared mm -hmm. times v. That'll be evaluated between zero and radical pi. And then I'll be subtracting the integral, but I know that my v has a minus, so that'll give me a plus. And so now I should have, here's my uh, du, and here is the v. And I can simplify that. Half times two is just going to be one. And now um, I can evaluate this new integral using another uh, substitution, the same well, change of variables that I made originally. I'll have y equals x squared. And so then I can also change the bounds of integration. And so now 0 goes on to 0. Radical pi will move on to pi. And so now uh, let me find the antiderivative of cosine y just being sine y. And I'll do the evaluation. So see that the first evaluation is using x for a variable. The second evaluation uses y for a variable. But really what I care about is the value in the end. So it's there's no need for me to go back. Now notice that the second evaluation makes no contribution because sine of pi and sine of zero are both zero. So the only contribution comes from the upper bound of the first evaluation. Look at another one where we might have to do some work before we're ready to do integration by parts. Here I only have one function times dx. And so, uh, you know, we said that sometimes you have to choose dx to be dv, but that's not going to work out in this case. So, what we want to do here is make a change of variables. I'm going to let y equal natural log of x. And then x will be e to the y, and dx is going to be e to the y dy. And now, if I rewrite this in terms of y, I have sine of y e to the y dy. Now I can use integration by parts here. This is, a, again, a choice uh, or an integral where it's not clear whether you should have u equals sine of y or u equals e to the y. Uh, fortunately, it will not make a difference in this case. And I just have to warn you right now, sometimes you start with what looks like a good choice for u and dv, uh, and then you get into the integral and you realize that it's not going to work out and you have to go back and try something different. So that's going to happen. Don't feel bad about it. Don't get too frustrated. Just know that, okay, let me go back and try a different choice, see if that works for me. But in this case, u equals sine of y is a good choice, meaning du is just going to be cosine of y dy. Uh, dv being e to the y dy means v equals e to the y. So substituting those into our formula, my uv is going to be sine of y e to the y. And then I will subtract off the integral cosine of y e to the y dy. So that didn't quite get me where I wanted to go. So let me try using integration by parts a second time. I'll have, in this case, u equals cosine y. So d u equals negative sine y dy. And then uh, dv will be e to the y, so v equals e to the y. So let's put these new values in our formula. So now I guess a little bit of, of word of warning. Uh, when If you choose u equals sine y first, and then you get du equals cosine y, you can't go over here and choose dv to be cosine of y. That's just going to take you in a circle in this particular case. You're just going to get back to the same integral. And what you're going to get is an identity. 
you would just get integral sine of y e to the y dy equals itself. Uh, so, um, you know, the idea is that if you started differentiating, say, the trig function, well, continue differentiating the trig function. And if you're anti-differentiating the exponential, continue with that same pattern. So now my new uv is cosine of y e to the y. And then uh, this will be a subtraction, but then I have a minus sine of y. So that's going to give me a plus there. And then distribute the minus sign. And then notice that on the left-hand side, I have the integral that I want. And that appears on the right-hand side with the minus sign, right? And so uh, what I can do then is add that integral to both sides, like we saw in a previous case. And so then now I've got twice that integral equaling the sum of these two functions. And so I can just divide both sides by two, add my constant of integration, and I have found my antiderivative. Oh, not quite yet. I'd like to go back to my original variable, which was x. So let's go ahead and make my substitution. e to the y is, is x. Sine of y is sine of natural log of x. Cosine of y would then be cosine of natural log of x. So in terms of the original variable, I would have this antiderivative. So here's an integral which shows up in a surprising number of places. And we've actually seen one example where this comes up, but we, just like so many other things, uh, there's usually more than one way to approach an antiderivative. So the way we approached it previously, we were able to avoid this integral. But let's go ahead and calculate it anyway, because we are certain to see it again throughout the course. So we're thinking about using integration by parts. Again, you say to yourself, well, there's only one function in the integrand. But what I can do is break that up as the product of secant of x times secant squared of x. And so then I'll have u equals secant x. So du is secant of x tangent of x dv is secant squared of x dx, because I know the antiderivative of secant squared is just tangent. So let's put these values into our formula for partial derivatives. My u times v would just be secant x times tangent x. Then subtract off v du. I see I have tangent of x times tangent of x. So I'm going to go ahead and just write that as tangent squared secant of x. And at this point, there's really a couple of options I could pursue. What I'm going to do is make use of one of our trig identities, that tangent squared x is secant squared x minus 1. So I'll replace the tangent squared x with secant squared x minus 1. Go ahead and distribute the secant x and break that up into two integrals. Remember, I have this minus a minus, so that's why this becomes a plus. And I see a situation that we've seen in two other examples where I have the same integral on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side, but with a minus sign. So I can go ahead and add the integral of secant cubed of x dx to both sides. Now here I'm left over with an integral I need to evaluate. Uh, the antiderivative of secant of x, we learned how to do that. Uh, it, it turns out you do a u substitution, it turns into um, a natural log. And remember the natural log was uh, secant of x plus tangent of x in absolute value signs. And so now I'm left with dividing both sides by two or multiplying by a half. And I just can't forget my constant of integration. So 
So there's a lot more examples that we could do, uh, but I'll leave those for you know, either problem solving sessions or office hours. I'll let you try to work them out yourself.